Now, a panel from the Technology Policy Institute's annual Aspen Forum on whether artificial intelligence and automation are destroying or creating jobs. This is about an hour. Okay. Um, so we're moving on to talk about artificial intelligence. So not a day goes by that we don't see another story uh, in the media about how artificial intelligence and automation, either one, are absolutely coming for our jobs, and you can see it already. Just take a look at the relatively low labor, low and declining labor force participation rate. And also, too, that um, it'll allow for the creation of completely new jobs and industries, just as in previous revolutions, and the, so there's nothing to worry about. And in any event, occupational churn is at an all-time low, so clearly there's nothing to worry about. Uh, and so probably the truth is well, somewhere between those, inclusive, maybe. Uh, and so that's what this panel is going to talk about. Are automation and AI, a, 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 to boil it down, a substitute or a complement to human labor? And we've got a great panel to discuss this today. I'll just I introduce them very quickly in alphabetical order. Their full bios are in the, um, in the program. Uh, we first have uh, Diane Bailey, who's an associate professor in the School of Information at UT Austin, where she studies technology and work. Her current research interests include engineering product design, remote occupational specialization, big data in healthcare and ICT for economic development. And she conducts large-scale empirical studies, often involving multiple occupations, countries, and researchers. Jeb Besson is uh, executive director of the Technology and Policy Research Initiative at the Boston University School of Law. Uh, despite being at a law school, he's an economist and has done research on whether patents promote innovation, why innovators share new knowledge, uh, and how technology affects jobs, skills, and wages. His latest book is Learning by Doing, The Real Connection Between Innovation, Wages, and Wealth. AJ Kamar is a researcher at the Adaptive Systems at Interaction Group at Microsoft Research. She works on several subfields of AI, including planning, machine learning, multi-agent systems, and human computer networks, uh, human computer teamwork, sorry. She particularly focuses on real-world applications that can benefit from the complementary abilities of humans and machines. Hal Varian uh, is chief economist at Google. Uh, he's been involved in many aspects of the company, including auction design, econometric analysis, finance, corporate strategy, and public policy. Also an emeritus professor at the University at UC Berkeley uh, in uh, three departments, business economics and information management. Okay, so a good place to start off this panel is to talk about what we actually mean by artificial intelligence. And um, uh, in sort of the preliminary discussions about the panel, AJ brought this up as, as sort of this should be the great place to start. So I'll, I'll ask you to, to lead off and tell us sort of where we are today with AI and what we mean when we're talking about it. Thank you, Scott. Um, first of all, thanks for inviting me to this panel. As a person who's studying AI and doesn't really involved in these policy discussions that much, it's a pleasure to be here and hear the discussion. Um, so AI, artificial intelligence, is a field that is around 70 years old. I started with Alan Turing when he wrote his paper on computing machines. And then around um, 1950s, um, the, the fathers of AI came together and wrote a paper that said, this is what AI is. I think we are going to be able to solve this AI problem in three months if you work hard enough. Um, and they had a meeting where they discussed all of these different applications of AI that we think about today. So many of those applications were discussed back then too. Um, the problem ended up being a bit more difficult than they thought it's going to be. Um, some things turn out to be easier, some things turn out to be harder. And that's why we've been, you know, as a field, going through these ups and downs and winters and summers where we kind of realize, okay, I think we are getting, getting better at this. Oh no, I think this is still pretty hard and kind of do this back and forth. So what is AI? Um, for, there are multiple definitions of AI. One definition that I like very much talks about, um, it's the activity of making machines intelligent. And what we mean by intelligence is, for whatever domain you are designed for, we expect a machine to act appropriately within its environment, by sensing its environment, by acting on it. That's what we mean by intelligent machines. However, intelligence is a term that we think of humans for. Like we think humans are intelligent, other animals are not. And a lot of the abilities that humans have, we expect an AI system to have. So another definition that's more human focused is having these abilities that are special to humans. Um, so what is going on right now, why we think AI is so much in the press? When I was a graduate student like 10 years ago, 
the advice that was given to me was like, if you're in the job market, don't say that you are doing AI because AI was a term that was so kind of poisonous and people thought nothing ever comes out of AI. However, that was the time that Google was booming and Google is an AI company from the birth. Um, so what is really going on is that there are three factors in the last five to 10 years that came together to make some of the algorithms we already had in the field very, very successful for some tasks that humans are really good at, like perception. What are these factors? These are, we have a lot of data now coming from sensors, coming from crowdsourcing, coming from human activities and the World Wide Web. We have more computation than ever before, and that's going to increase as well. And these two factors made some well-known algorithms like deep neural networks very, very successful. Now we know how to train these existing algorithms. And through this, now we are seeing great advances in perception tasks like speech recognition, image recognition, and well-defined tasks like, for example, Go, the success that DeepMind had. So when we see these tasks that are very we associate with humans like perceiving the world, world, understanding what the objects are. We are saying, I guess machines are really getting intelligent this time. So, um, just before we go into the labor aspects of it, uh, AI discuss, AI has been around. People have been working on it for 70 years. Um, it comes and goes in popularity. Uh, is it the case that in one, the last time it was popular, someone might have had a panel like this where people were sitting up there saying, this is the time it's going to work? Um, or is there really something different this time? So I think that's the question that mm -hmm. we are here for to discuss. Nobody knows the answer of that. Um, however, when you look around, even before this new wave, there, were, there are already a lot of applications of AI that people use every day, like search engines, like all of the optimization algorithms that run in supply chain management systems. So it's not like AI wasn't there. Um, I think it, AI was good for some tasks that humans weren't good at, like understanding probabilities, making planning decisions, making optimization decisions. Now with these new techniques, AI is entering into tasks that AI wasn't good at, but humans were really good at. And that is creating, first of all, the discussion around what other tasks machines will be able to do now that we have these techniques. And second, what does this mean for the human jobs? And that, that is something we need to see. However, there is another discussion which is, does this mean that we are getting to general artificial intelligence? <coughs> which means I'm gonna have one AI technique that's gonna become so good that without much customization, I'm gonna be able to solve all AI tasks. I don't think we are getting there, and that's my personal opinion. Okay. Um, so, let's, uh, Jim, you've been writing about uh, uh, labor and AI, so tell us your view. Are we going to be jobless? <laughs> uh, and is that good or bad? <laughs> is, yeah, uh, my, not in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, so, we've actually had AI in the workplace, in the, in the marketplace since, I think, 1987, where AI systems were used to uh, do uh, uh, f fraud detection and credit card systems. Um, but we've had computer automation, so some of which isn't so different from AI, uh, since the 1950s. Um, what's interesting is that we're seeing an acceleration, both in the, in the scope of things that AI can, can handle, um, and in maybe in the pace of, at which it's, it's addressing them. So it's about automation, and, and, and what's the impact of automation. And we perennially have, uh, I think, a, a basic, many people basically misunderstand um, what automation means for jobs. It's, it's commonly assumed if a job is, uh, some tasks in a job are automated, that uh, jobs are lost in that occupation. Uh, and that's simply not true. We, we can look at manufacturing, and yes, we're very well aware lots of manufacturing jobs have been lost to automation. Uh, in the 1940s, there were nearly half a million textile workers, cotton textile workers in the U.S., and now there are only 16,000. Um, and most of that difference is from automation. There's some from global trade. Um, but that's clearly had a dramatic effect on many communities and on many workers and their families. But the thing to remember is automation can also increase jobs. And in fact, we only got to have half a million textile workers because 
for the previous 100 years before 1940, uh, automation was accompanied by job growth. Well, this seems strange. How, how can automation sometimes create uh, more jobs and, and, and sometimes eliminate jobs? And, and, and what's going on and what does that mean? And, and it comes down to demand. When you, when you look at something like textile automation, at the beginning of the 19th century, the average person had one set of clothing. Uh, automation meant that the price of cloth went down, which meant people could afford more. Demand was very elastic, so they bought a lot more. In fact, they bought so much more that even though they needed fewer workers to, do, to produce the cloth, uh, many more workers were employed because they were buying that much more cloth. You come to the mid 20th century and people have closets full of clothing, you know, a further price decline is just simply not going to uh, produce much more demand for cloth, and so then you have automation as, as a, the net effect of, of eliminating jobs. You, now, if you look today, what's happening with computer automation, um, we, we see lots of evidence of examples where computer automation, just like the early textile automation, is creating jobs. So one of my favorite examples is the bank teller. Um, you, you, there's a, a great un, untapped demand, or there was a great untapped demand for getting cash at remote locations. The ATM machine came along, and people assume that's going to wipe out the bank teller. In fact, we actually have more bank tellers uh, since the ATM was installed in numbers. And, and the reason is uh, it made it cheaper to operate a bank branch. Banks could open up more branches and serve more people. There was a market demand for that. And so they just built so many more branches that even though they needed fewer tellers per branch, uh, they were employing many more. And, and that's, I think, the pattern that we're going to continue to see in many sectors of the economy, not in manufacturing, uh, over the next 10 or 20 years. And that's basically what I think the immediate response is going to be to, to AI as well. So I know, Diane, you'll have um, res the response to that. But before we go to you, um, <clears throat> it's a, you, you, you say that um, a, a, even accelerating change in AI will generate more jobs more quickly. Um, but that's completely, you know, that's counter to what some others say uh, about the role. So I, I'm Eric Brynholfsson, for example, who spoke here a couple years ago, uh, says that one of the differences is the, that the rate of change isn't allowing industries to catch up. And you're, or sorry, allowing the labor market to catch up. Uh, you're you're sort, of, sort of saying exactly the opposite, right? That the faster the, the, ch the, faster the change is, the better it will be. Yeah, yeah. so, and, well, there's two things, y yes and no. So a faster change will actually, you know, if you have elastic demand and you're, you're, you're making a faster change, you're going to, you know, so that, that uh, productivity improvements are bringing job growth. If you make faster productivity improvements, you're going to have faster job growth, at least uh, for, for the period of time where that's occurring. It's going to be disruptive, though, in another sense. And, I, and so I don't mean to, I, I maybe uh, was overly optimistic in the way I describe things. We're... The, 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 when the question is, are we going to be, see mass unemployment in the next 10 or 20 years, the answer is no. Are we going to see lots of individual jobs destroyed? Yes, but we're going to see jobs destroyed and others created. As that pace accelerates, that's disruptive. You, you know, those textile workers in North Carolina need to find jobs, need to have skills. Uh, there may be jobs, there are jobs opening up in the rest of the economy. And, and, and same thing everywhere else. We're, we are seeing and we'll continue to see uh, jobs eliminated. So the, the acceleration will put more stress on our ability to, to transition people, to retrain them, to, to relocate them. Um, Diana, you, I, I know you're much more, um, less optimistic. Well, I, I, I would just push a little bit by asking this. Um, in, in 2004, a guy named Gordon Lafer wrote a book called The Job Training Charade. And, and what he talked about was that we were losing a lot of manufacturing jobs. And the way that we talked about that was, well, these people need to be retrained into other jobs. So for example, uh, we'll train them to be bakers and work at the supermarket in the bakery. Well, it turned out that there's only so much bread and pastries that we can eat and that there weren't enough of these other jobs for people to take. And that the language of job retraining started to change from teaching people new technical skills to enter different jobs to focusing on what they called soft skills. And people started to be told, well, the reason that you have a 
you don't have a job isn't because you're lacking some technical skills. It's because your communication skills aren't very good or this kind of thing. You don't work well on a team. It started to put the onus on workers for their lack of soft skills um, rather than recognizing that we'd had a structural shift in the economy and what kinds of jobs were available. I was asked um, about two weeks ago to sit on a National Academies of Engineering panel to talk about engineering workforce and how they needed to be more adaptive to survive in this new economy that we're going to be seeing. And I work at a large public institution, University of Texas. So getting an invite to sit on a National Academy of Engineering panel is kind of a big deal. It means I can put it on my CV and next year you might get a 3% raise instead of my 2% raise. Okay, I had some skin in the game. But I turned it down. And I turned it down because I told them I didn't believe in the premise of their panel, okay? That I felt that they were putting the onus on engineers to become more adaptable, learn new skills, be a quick learner. They're telling all of us these things rather than saying, you know what? We're going to start seeing some really fundamental shifts in the economy and maybe we ought to start planning for that as all of us. Not just us individuals running around suddenly becoming more adaptive, better quick learners, moving up the scale. Because there's only so much room at the top. If what we think about AI might be true, there's only going to be so many jobs up there. And not all of us are equipped to go up that analytic and conceptual ladder to take those jobs at the top. So that worries me what's going to be left for everyone. So. Um... I think there are a lot of problems with job training, and I think it's even more complex than that. We've got issues about geographic relocation, because what, what, where you, you see a lot of the jobs appearing is not where a lot of the unemployment is. You also have a, a great difficulty. My, my book is called Learning by Doing, and one of the, the mm -hmm. themes is that mm -hmm. a lot of new technology-related skills have to be learned on the job, and, and it's, so it's not a matter of the classroom entirely. We have to come up with new ways of getting people experience. Um, but I think we do see plenty of sectors where there are mid-skilled jobs emerging in numbers. Um, it may be difficult. So, for instance, nursing, uh, nursing jobs have been, you know, in great demand for a long time. Yet, it's still often very difficult for people to transition into those. Um, and and maybe we don't have enough. I, I think we don't understand what it, what it, what's involved in mm -hmm. in making all these transitions. Mm -hmm. So, Hal, I want to say something specific, but also you're going to bring in the longer term with, demo with, de with right. demography. So. So, I, so I want to say a word about this job training issue, which I think is very interesting. <laughs> if the demand for the jobs here and the skills are here, there are two ways to solve that problem. You can bring the skills up to the demands, or you can bring the job down. And, in fact, there's a lot of that that's going on uh, through technology because it used to be to be a cashier, you had to know how to make change. Well used to be to be a taxi driver you had to know how to navigate around town not necessary anymore used to be to be a veterinarian had to be able to identify 150 breeds of dogs not necessary anymore we can do that with uh, with ai or with your phone for that matter so this cognitive assist is really a big deal because it allows for the kind of on the job training you're talking about you drive around town you kind of learn your way you learn how to make change because that's what the machine tells you you learn the breeds of dogs on the job and there's a lot of delivery mechanisms now which are extremely efficient in the on-the-job delivery of education. So look at YouTube. There are 500 million video views per day of how-to videos on YouTube. And I'll bet you almost everyone in this audience has fixed something in their house by going and looking at that YouTube video. So these aren't just high-level cognitive skills like solving quadratic equations or areas. They're actually important manual labor skills that people can learn how to weld, how to replace the screen door, how to hang a window, I mean, all sorts of different things. Although if I were gonna play devil's advocate here, that's a lot of repair people who didn't get called in to do some work. Say it again? If I were gonna play devil's advocate, I might point out that those are a lot of repair people who didn't get called in to do work. Yeah, that's right, but the point is, when you look at the, my next part of my talk, we'll mm -hmm. see about what happens to them. Uh, all right, so I want to I want to talk about the theme that relates to this uh, discussion. We've talked about the demand for labor, and the theory is, or some people su suggest, that, re that uh, AI and automation will reduce the demand for labor. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at the supply of labor, we get quite a different story, because there's only one social science that can predict ten years ahead, and that's demography. 
right? Everything kind of pales besides that. So let's look at demography. 1946, that's when the baby boom started, basically 1946 to 1964. And after the baby boom, there was the baby bust. And after the baby bust, there's the echo of the baby boom. And you can look through this whole, uh, whole series of uh, population changes and basically add 65 years to it, and we see what's happening now. Namely, all those baby boomers are uh, retiring, and that's followed by the baby bust. What does that mean? Right now, the labor force is growing at half the rate of the population. In the decade of the 20s, you're going to see the lowest growth in the labor force ever uh, since they started measuring it around World War II. Uh, if you look at uh, the labor force, if you restrict immigration, the labor force is actually going to decline. Now, all those baby boomers are retiring. They expect to continue consuming, right? But you need some workers somewhere to be producing the stuff that they need to consume. And so you've got this race going on between automation, which is increasing productivity, and you've got the supply of labor, which is really very, very low to declining. And we've got it good in the US. Go look at China, Japan, Korea, Germany, Italy. They're seeing outright declines in the labor force and it's very, very worrisome from the point of view of the future of their economies. Now, look at robots. So what countries have the most investment in robots? Guess what? China, Japan, Korea, Germany, Italy. They have to have those robots. They have to have some improved efficiency, some improved productivity in order to produce the stuff that their population is going to be demanding. So that's true as a worldwide phenomenon. And by all accounts, unless there are some really big surprises on the automation side, you're going to see a tight labor market uh, in developed countries for the next 25 to 30 years. And that's just reading it right off of the demographics. How far down the line do you see that, uh, the, the labor force becoming more uh, concerned? Yeah, what's interesting is when you look at the figures around 2060, you start seeing the labor force growing at the same rate as the population. And it, it's interesting to think this is all because of this huge shock of World War II that's created a, a, this gigantic demographic event which doesn't really work itself out for 100 years. So it's the baby boomer's fault. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it seems like, so, so far I think we, there are four separate, four issues. One is sort of, sort of the general uh, short term versus the long term. Uh, and the second is, uh, is there anything you can do for people who might be who uh, might, I'm not sure what the right word is, displaced in the short run, um, and you know, does job training play a role given what we've learned about the effectiveness of that? Uh, then the distributional effects, which could be both short and long term, uh, and then over time the demographics, then the demand for labor, which will swamp everything. Um, so, Diane, what in the short, oh, sorry, and the, uh, the inequality issue, whether it just, whether the benefits just accrue to a small group. Um, so Diane, you turned down this position um, at, the, at the academies, um, but what do you think then, what, what should their project have focused on to address your concerns? Um, I, I think that what we ought to be paying attention to is uh, power dynamics. So, you know, you hear a lot um, if you read about um, books on AI and predictions about the jobs. Um, that folks will do things like look at Bureau of Labor Statistics um, data that describe jobs and describe the tasks in jobs. And they'll say, well, based on that description of tasks, we'll tell you that some percentage of jobs are going to be automated or replaced by AI within some period of time, right? And so they're doing that simply based on a description of what people do. No job is just what you do. Every job takes place in an environment that's surrounded by, uh, for example, uh, all kinds of occupational norms and perhaps uh, regulations. So uh, I spent a decade studying how engineers are using new computational techniques and software, things like finite element analysis, because I wanted to understand how it was changing design and analysis in that field and what it was doing to the workforce. I'll just give you two quick examples that kind of point out um, issues of power and when workers have power and how they can control technology choices that are made for them and when they aren't in power. So the example that shows some power actually um, 
uh, is power that's held by the, the government somewhat. If you look at uh, civil engineers who design building structures uh, like the one that we're in, uh, their solutions are governed by uh, strict laws and regulations uh, uh, that involve things like um, peer review and county review of plans for buildings. Because if this building were to fall down, those of us who survived would sue. Okay, So the person who's responsible uh, is the senior engineer who put his professional stamp on the drawings for this building. And because that person faces professional liability, um, they're very careful about using automation in their work because they know that computer software programs can yield um, unrealistic uh, solutions based on infeasible assumptions in the first place. And for civil engineers, everything is about those assumptions of how load travels through buildings, for example, that guide designs. And so they've rejected a lot of automation. It's not that they don't use techniques like FEA, they do. But they don't use any automation between the steps of engineering design and um, analysis that we see in other fields. Now I'll go to automotive engineers. Uh, Sorry to interrupt, but then are you, are you portraying that as, as a positive thing about engineering? Because we don't, I mean, does that necessarily make us safer or less safe that they're rejecting I think new it technologies? Makes us, uh, I think it makes us much safer. And I would be, I, I would hesitate to ride in an elevator in a building that I thought that a computer had designed. And I, all of the civil engineers that I watched would tell you the same thing, Okay. And it's because you have to watch, and they've shown, I could go in countless examples. I don't study things at the macro level, I study things at the micro level. I spend hours sitting at the elbow of engineers while they're designing. And while they're designing, I talk to them. Uh, the computer crashes, we have time for a short interview. I ask them, why did they choose that interview? Why did they do this thing? Why did they, um, at the automotive firm I was in, they had a secret laptop with secret um, uh, software one that they weren't supposed to use anymore that they had locked in a desk that was empty and the boss didn't know about it because they were only supposed they were restricted in the software programs they were supposed to use. These are the kinds of things I ask them. Why do you pick these technologies? Why do you use these technologies? So the so I think it's a good thing that the legislation was there and the civil engineers took safety. They didn't take it as a harness and something they wanted to shake. They took it as an ethical obligation and something that they were proud of, something that made them different. Okay, Automotive engineers. Automotive engineers do not have the same kinds of things guiding their work. Yes, they have um, the National Tra uh, Transportation Safety Board that uh, tests vehicles, but there's no stamp that has to be put on them. The vehicles just have to pass these government tests. Their work has been rationalized. Their work has been digitized. Their work has been computerized in ways that is changing what's happening with that workforce. So very quickly, I'll just say that the engineers that I studied in their firm since about 2004 have a hiring freeze on analysis engineers in the US. They only hire analysis engineers, simulation engineers in India. Because they built a big center there, and my team spent months at that center, and we spent months in Michigan. And what they do in that center is they have offshored the work of building the FEA models. And the reason they were able to offshore that work was because We've digitized the models. We've digitized and we've mathematized. And that means you can travel. They can travel along computer internet lines. And so people in India are able to do that work for a fraction of the cost of what a US engineer wants. So this was my point about adaptable. How could the US engineers that wanted to do that work be adaptive in the US? They, they'd have to move to India. You couldn't do that job anymore in the US, so that was a change. It came about because those engineers didn't have the same kind of power to control what they do. And I'll conclude with just a group that does have power, radiologists. Guess what? All of your medical scans can also be sent abroad for reading, and they are. They're often sent at night when your radiologist doesn't want to be woken up. So they send it to India. And in India, a radiologist will examine it, and it comes back to the US. Why do we still have radiologists employed in the US? Because the ARA, their professional association, lobbied for legislation that says that those scans have to be signed off in the morning by a board-certified U.S.-trained radiologist. Um, Hal, response to, to that? 
Oh, well, I think, I think that's absolutely right. The, the, the radiology not only can be done in India, but uh, now can be done uh, automatically. Uh, and that's been actually true not just recently, but that's been, been true for a decade or two. Uh, because in a lot of cases, recognizing the uh, malignant cell or something like that is, is really pretty straightforward and can be done by uh, even relatively untrained labor. Now, there are border cases and lots of things where you might want to have some adult supervision of the sort you were describing, but then adult supervision can also be turned into uh, basically exercising exclusionary power to uh, keep a, a privileged position. So, uh, yeah, I think that's true. I've often said uh, we'd have driverless vehicles, we'd have autonomous vehicles on the road now if it weren't for those darn human drivers. Not to mention the pedestrians, which are even worse. Yeah. If you have a controlled environment, then you can, like a freeway, like an expressway, a controlled environment, it's really uh, possible to have uh, autonomous vehicles right now, and it was possible to have autonomous vehicles at least a decade ago in, the, in that context. It's dealing with all the exception handling that's a problem in many of these cases. Yeah, that's a good place for you to jump in. So when we hear discussions about AI, there is a lot of discussions about like super intelligence or like taking all jobs away. But I worry about something more short term than that, which is as AI applications enter the society, these applications, AI algorithms have their problems too. And how are we going to be handling these shortcomings of AI algorithms is going to be the determinant of how we get value out of these technologies. So I mentioned at the beginning that deep learning is one of the reasons that um, there is this new excitement about AI. However, that excitement comes with a downside. These algorithms are very hard for people to understand. So when these algorithms are making a prediction, and this relates very much with Diane's comments about, oh, if I know when my algorithm is doing the wrong thing, then I can override it. So with statistical techniques, and when these algorithms are, are learning from large amounts of data, it is quite impossible to understand when these, what these algorithms are going to be doing for each case. On top of that, these algorithms get updated pretty often. For example, Tesla cars. <laughs> Their algorithms about how they are going to be driving gets updated pretty much every week. And as a driver, you are expected to understand this week, how should I trust my Tesla? So there is a big transparency problem between the AI algorithm and either the user or the controller or the supervisor of this algorithm. And we need to do a lot of work to make that layer transparent in the sense that we can actually create a trustworthy partnership between the human and the machine so that they can work together. So that we can get to that case where, um, okay, I know my algorithm is not doing the right thing, I should override. But there is a sharing of responsibility issue too when that happens. For example, one of the cases where AI algorithm has been used in, um, in public space is parole decisions and sentencing decisions that happen in our legal system. So for, decade, for a decade now, and it's not a new thing, that statistical learning algorithms have been employed in courts for making sentencing and parole decisions. So there is a beautiful ProPublica article that discusses issues by having such a system working with judges, and that's a great read for all of us to understand the, some of the social issues that come through the use of AI in public space. So one issue is, if you are a judge and need, under time pressure, need to make these decisions, wouldn't it be much easier for you just to agree with the machine decision? What do you really gain by overriding it? Because it's a lose-lose case. If you override it and the person commits a crime, then you're in fault. If the algorithm says something, you follow for it, it was algorithm's decision. So we need to really think very hard about the balance of opinions and the control and who is really responsible for these decisions when you actually have a team of AI and human making decisions. Who is responsible in that case? These, these case studies also show that AI algorithms can be quite biased. For example, they were analyzing how these statistical techniques were making parole decisions for African Americans and whites in the society. But these, these, sorry to interrupt. I mean, these yeah. are huge, yeah. huge issues. But let's try to stay more, a little more narrowly focused because we can, we can, you know, expand. But 
But how, I mean, but, to, but still to take that theme though, um, how in, in your work or in others' work, do you try to bring, um, how do you try to make humans and AI complementary, um, whether it's in labor or in trying to understand what's, what's going on? I think we need to move away from this thought that AI is gonna automate and humans are gonna adapt to it. That's not what needs to happen. I think what we need to work on is, yes, we are going to be automate, we're, we are going to be working on automation for giving these kind of capabilities to AI, but we have to design really hard about, we have to think really hard about the design of the system we are developing and that middle layer in terms of the AI explaining itself to the human, human having some transparent layer with, hum, with the machine, and working on that coordination, and I think that's the only way we are going to get this equation right. Yeah. I, yeah, I think there's some other issues too. Uh, so think about the, the exceptions in self-driving vehicles. Um, the, the very often black swan events, very, very hard to predict. And so you need a huge amount of data to come up with any sort of reliable estimate of how safe a vehicle is. So you think about self-driving cars where, say, Tesla has an enormous amount of proprietary data that it's guiding its algorithms but an insurance company or government regulators don't have access to the same data, or the, the public in general. So it becomes very difficult to understand what the actual risk is without some sort of uh, data sharing or other, uh, you know, so there, 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 there's a new set of issues, I think, emerging in terms of data transparency. And so I, I think you're exactly right. There will be demands for interoperability and uh, data sharing for safety reasons. Uh, look at the airline industry as an example. I mean, when there's an airline event, there's immediately an investigation by several different parties with different constituencies and interests, and they try to resolve the cause of the event and make sure it doesn't happen again. I think that same infrastructure, that same set of procedures be carried over into this uh, context uh, without much objection. I mean, who's going to stand up and object to that kind of, uh, yeah. of investigation? One thing about the news, when you look at the journalism on AI, they're always picking the, accept, the, the kind of uh, uh, interesting cases, uh, Go and poker and all these games and other things. If you want to get an idea of what's really done in the ordinary sorts of cases, go look at Kaggle. Kaggle is a company that sets up machine learning competitions. So one company might say, we will offer a prize of a million dollars to the party that's the best able to predict hospital readmission uh, within 90 days using this data set. Now I have to say two qualifications. One is I was an angel investor in Kaggle and Kaggle was recently acquired by Google. So <laughs> <laughs> nothing to do with each other, those two facts. But, uh, but it is quite interesting because you can see things like housing appraisal. Zillow put up a uh, data set of houses, features, and values and come up with the best model for appraising houses. Uh, YouTube videos. Google actually put up uh, uh, 4.5 million labeled YouTube videos and has a contest on trying to predict what people are doing in the video. Because even though still images... We have a very good technology for that now. We are, don't have a good, very good technology for videos, for active people moving around. Are they exercising? Are they dancing? Are they fighting? You know, whatever. Uh, readmission to hospital, the example I mentioned, uh, recognizing leaves, counting plankton. I mean, there's just all sorts of applications, 230-some applications, and you can get an idea of what is actually going on in ordinary business practice. And it's quite, quite interesting. Uh, what's happening there. So I think we're going to see this diffusing and there will be the really exciting cases like the driverless vehicles and, and the humans beating uh, Zen uh, Go champions. But uh, there's a lot of ordinary activities that are being automated as well. But if I can just add one thing. AI has a long tail problem. So that this comes to your point where you say there are a lot of edge cases. In the real world, AI has to deal with a lot of edge cases. And if you look at all the cases where we have a lot of data, if you look at the distribution of the data, for some cases we have a lot of data. But as the cases get more edge and edge and edge, we have less data. And the common techniques we use, the statistical learning techniques, are very good to learn the 
head of this distribution, not so much the tail. So to get the tail right, we really need to think very hard about how to get it right. It could be through collection of edge cases, creating um, you know, data sets of those edge cases, sharing and within the industry. But we also need to think about some kind of collection of techniques working together, not only stick to one technique, but collection of techniques working together, and maybe with human supervision too, to get those edge cases right. Because just saying, okay, we are getting 95% accuracy on this data set, doesn't necessarily mean that that application is gonna be providing value to you in the short term. And that comes to your question about why we haven't seen productivity effects from AI mm -hmm. yet. Because when you think about those accuracy curves, you need to think about what is the point where I'm going to be able to get value from this technology? And that's a, that's a different question. So Diane wanted to say something how, and I want to go to questions too, so get them ready. Okay. Um, I just want to return to the self-driving thing because I think one thing to bear in mind is for us to pay attention to the rhetoric that's being used around AI. Um, and I agree that the media focuses on um, the fascinating cases, but I also think that the tech companies put out a lot of rhetoric of their own. An example for self-driving vehicles is I bet all of you can tell me how many motor vehicle deaths a year we expect to save by using self-driving vehicles because they use this number in every article. It's 1.2 million lives. What you might not know is that's the number of motor vehicle deaths per year worldwide. The number in the US, and it's not that we don't care about the rest of the world, but I'll explain why they're different. The number in the US is 35,000 deaths per year. To let you know where that number sits, I'm going to situate it between what's right below it and what's right above it. Right below it, 5% lower, deaths by falling down. Right above it, 25% higher, deaths by poisoning. Okay? We don't see AI solutions for falling down or being poisoned. We see AI solutions for motor vehicle deaths. Well, let's talk about motor vehicle deaths. They reached their peak in the 1970s, and they've been decreasing ever since. And why have they been decreasing? Because of mechanical and electrical improvements in vehicles that have been ongoing, and also because of regulations and laws, things like uh, DUI laws and sobriety checkpoints and mandatory seatbelts. So you have to ask yourself, why are we therefore so interested in self-driving vehicles if it looks like the thing about saving lives isn't really it. It's solving a problem that's already solving itself. And if you look at commercial truck drivers, which is the first group of, um, of the first Wait, occupational group. I don't think you've group, made that point, really. Pardon? I mean, the number of deaths from, from, uh, from automobiles is going down, but that doesn't mean that self-driving cars wouldn't re further reduce it. I'm not sure, right. I'm not sure exactly what your point is. Well, self-driving vehicles might help to reduce the number, but the number that we're talking about realistically is 35,000 in this country. And then you can look at other countries. If you look, the University of Michigan's Transportation Institute in 2014 put out a map of the 25 countries with the most ve uh, motor vehicle deaths per year. And if you look at that map, you're going to get a sense of what the roads in those countries look like. There are no way that, because of things like uh, Hal brought up, um, they're chaotic roads. You're not going to have them. Uh, I go to India a lot. I have for the last two decades. There's no way you're going to have self-driving vehicles in India. And the chairman and CEO of Maruti Suzuki, which is the largest automaker in India, says the same thing. He says, we're not going to have self-driving vehicles anywhere anytime soon because it's chaos on our roads, right? So, so we have other ways that we can bring these numbers down. So I don't think that the real motivation for why we're going after self-driving vehicles is to reduce motor vehicle deaths. I think that there's some other motivation. And I would love to have that conversation because maybe the conversation is, we could really redesign our cities and improve and end and, and some of our climate change problems. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, let's have that conversation. How who wanted to respond? Um, let's see. Oh, yes. Well, well, I will say, if you look at the examples you gave, uh, they have this common theme, namely there's advances in monitoring. So people who fall over, if they're monitored within their home, that can be notified either by themselves or by the home can say there's a problem. Same thing, I just saw, in fact, a talking pill bottle that uh, warns you about what you're taking and whether you uh, already took this this morning and all sorts of other things. So th there are a lot of cases, I don't know if I'd call it AI, but I would just say technology, where you're seeing technological advances of one form or another that help people live safer, more productive lives. And uh, in a way, 
uh, th this uh, issue about the self-driving car, the problem is dealing with all these exceptions. I asked the team, do you break for squirrels? Mm -hmm. Now that's a decision, right? Because avoiding a squir squirrel could cause lots of damage elsewhere. They said, no. I said, do you break for dogs? They said, how big's the dog? <laughs> do you break for deer? Well, yes, of course we break for deer because there's a huge number of accidents <laughs> involving the deer. What we need is uh, you know, automated deer to avoid the car so we can get out of the way. <laughs> We'd have, a, we'd have a much safer road environment. <laughs> um, let's, uh, we have little time left. Uh, questions? Uh, Larry. Okay. Wait, uh, wait, uh, uh, actually. I have to use the mic. I was a cheerleader in high school. <laughs> yeah, because of, the, because, of the, because of the video. All right, sorry. Is it on? Yeah. All right. Um, let's come back to the topic, demand for labor. Uh, and back in my graduate school days, uh, Vasily Leontiev, Nobel Prize winner, threw out to the class uh, the horse paradox or horse story, uh, pointed out that between 1900 and 1940, the population of horses in the United States had gone way, 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 way down. Why? Because of the internal combustion engine. Uh, and we had horseless vehicles rather than personal, personless vehicles for personal transportation outside of urban areas for short-term uh, haul within urban and, and uh, you know, hauling freight within urban areas and, of course, on farms. And cars, trucks, tractors. You know, now, didn't uh, totally reduce you know, eliminate all horses. There was still a small population left. But clearly, the market clearing wage for horses went way down below reproduction uh, uh, sustaining levels. Fortunately, horses have shorter lives. Fortunately, we feel differently about how to deal with surplus horses. But so the question is, could we are, are we confident, and Hal, I take your point about labor supply may well, you know, modify, uh, ameliorate, but still, the issue of the demand for labor, we've, and arguably we've been so lucky over the past two centuries that, the, that technology shifts haven't really diminished the demand for labor, if anything, pushed the demand for labor out, but we can't rule out the possibility of a technology change doing to humans what the technology change between 1900 and 1940 did to horses. So the question is either what, what happens if we're horses or if, horses had, if, if the population of horses had not decreased? Well, right, that the market clearing right. wage falls way, 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 way low, and then what? Right, okay. So th there are two, two issues here. One is uh, it's difficult to retrain horses. <laughs> it's difficult to retrain people, too. I mean, it's not, it's not a direct comparison. Um, so you have, you know, we can certainly look at occupations that have largely gone away. Uh, and we've taken those people and, and, and absorbed them in, in other capacities. Um, and that's generally been true. Now, why has it been true? So if you look at individual occupations, it's a story about demand. So when demand's elastic, uh, there's job growth. Uh, but when demand starts getting inelastic, uh, further automation leads to job declines, and, and they can be dramatic. Um, so, so in, the, <coughs> in, in a 10 or 20 year time frame, we're not going to see a dramatic change in, in, in the nature of demand. But it's a good question further out. Are we going to basically be able to satiate demand in one market after another after another so that there are no jobs left? And that really raises sort of a broader philosophical question about what is it that humans want? Um, so people have, John Maynard Keynes in the, in the 1930s, uh, and, and I think Leontief had some writings in a similar vein, talked about, you know, you know by this time we were going to have a, a huge amount of leisure time and technological unemployment. Um, if, if you look at what's happened to leisure time, the, yes, the work week has declined fairly dramatically since the 
you know, the, the, the 1800s when you had a 72 hour work week and now we're down to 34 hours, but it's been remarkably slow because, and, and you have to ask ultimately at some level it's because people are getting value. There, there's a, a demand for uh, things that they will either consume or demand for even how they obtain their leisure and leisure enjoyment. So the technology of leisure has dramatically increased uh, you know, in terms of video games, in terms of movies, and, and, and all these various things. So the, the question comes down to, in 50 years, are the, is there going to be anything that humans want that machines can't deliver? Um, and I, I think some, I, we're at a philosophical level. Do, do, do humans want interaction with other humans? Do humans want, uh, you, you know, is, is the personal role uh, an important aspect of what humans want, uh, both in terms of what they're doing for gainful em employment and in, in terms of, of how they want to consume. And I mean, I, I don't think I would deign to answer that, but it, I, can, I can simply point to some very bright people like, like Keynes, uh, you know, just had a, a very hard time imagining all the additional things that humans might want that might cause them not to have a, a 10 hour work week. Um, how you want to say yeah, I, I just wanted to say a, a couple follow-ups on that. One is 80% of the U.S. economy is services. So clearly people are involved, or want to be involved with other people because there are lots of those services you could automate pretty easy. I don't really need a person to lead me to my table at the restaurant. You could flash little arrows on the floor or something to make that happen. But we want that, okay? People want those uh, services. On the work week, Nothing's written in stone about a five-day work week. Mexico, if you look at the OECD countries, work week in Mexico is 45 hours, in the U.S., 37 hours, and the Netherlands, 30 hours. France is slightly behind at about 33. So you can take some of that increased productivity and leisure if you want. Absolutely, no question about it. And you would get very few objections, I think, if people said, hey, let's have every weekend be a three-day weekend, which is pretty much what's technologically possible today. That could easily happen if people chose to move in that, uh, in that direction. And finally, I want to say one last word about the first invasion of the robots. first invasion of the robots was around the 1880s to 1910 or so, and it's domestic robots. It's washing machines, it's dryers, it's dishwashers, it's lawnmowers, sewing machines. All of those mechanical innovations that made home work far, far more productive. And so you saw women in particular, as Deirdre mentioned, uh, shifting from the household into the labor market. Uh, and you've seen this tremendous increase in output from on a household basis, partly due to that kind of uh, innovation, like uh, in automation. Um, yeah. Well, I'm, I, I, I've introduced myself as an economic hist, um, historian, and besides the beside the secret handshake which we have, we're supposed to t t tell people about how things were the same in the past. And I don't think AI is distinct from, say, the, say, say the bow and arrow, which is a substitute for spears, or the horse which is a substitute for uh, human messengers on foot. And of course, these technologies have implications. The horse was an instrument of the aristocracy because they were expensive to maintain for a while. But I I, I think on the whole, these, these robots, which is what a shovel is, a shovel is a robot, a scythe is a robot, are to be viewed with um, optimism. And here's a number which ought to be in everyone's mind. It's not true that the number of jobs created or lost in the United States are what's reported every month about 200,000 jobs when things are good, 
minus 200,000 jobs when things are bad. In fact, every year, 20 million jobs are lost in the United States. This is in a workforce of 160, 160 million. So there's a tremendous amount of churning, quite appropriately. In, in 2000, there are 130,000 people employed in video stores. So I, I, I urge you all to be of, to be of, to be of good, good cheer. Um, I think we, we, <laughs> we probably have time for one more question. But also, I just wanted to point out that actually comes back to something that AJ said right at the beginning, which is whether we're moving towards, uh, I think you called it a general artificial intelligence, right? right? Is it a general purpose technology or is it a shovel? Um, and there's a huge difference between those. Yeah. Just push a back on that, uh, Deirdre, because I want to know then if you're rejecting, Eric Brynjolfsson and others have, have argued that if we look back at, at other technological innovations, like the McCormick Reaper is an example he uses, um, yes, it transformed agriculture and threw a lot of people out of work. But because we didn't have simultaneous innovations going on in other industries, there were places for them to go pretty quickly. And his argument is, is that what we're going to see with AI is simultaneous innovations across all industries, so there's like nowhere left to run. Would you, would you say that you don't agree with that idea? No, and, and, and I'd like to know how he knows that. <laughs> how he knows that they're happening across? I, I think he's looking even at the present. Okay, how, how does he know the present? I mean, if, if he's so smart, I'd like to see why he isn't rich. These are, these are highly unpredictable things. You, no one knew that the invention of gunpowder in China would radically change the, 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 the position of the armored aristocracy. <laughs> Um, I think we should. We need to. Uh, we need to wrap up. Uh, so uh, we'll take a short break. Let's say ten minutes, um, and then we'll start with the next panel. Because if the next panel goes over, then we're going to miss the eclipse, and um, we won't let anybody out to go see it. So be back here by ten twenty. But uh, join me in thanking the panel for what I thought was a good discussion. Are you sure?